Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 568, Interview with Psychologist Dr. Michael Mahan. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your host is Dr. Kathy Moffat, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging. Dr. Maupin is the author of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the award-winning book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of testosterone replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. Today we are going to talk about alcoholism in the family and how to um, correctly decide if your family member or your friend has a problem with alcohol. The reason I am bringing this up now is because in 2020 and 2021, because of the quarantine, the problem of alcoholism was huge in my practice and outside my practice, friends, countrymen, and all kinds of other people who talked to me and asked me about how to talk to their family member who had become an alcoholism during quarantine. I have a difficult time confronting people, so I'm not naturally good at this. I also was never trained to do this in medical school. I do not have a huge knowledge of alcoholism. But my guest, Michael Mahan, who is a physician or who is a doctor of psychology, excuse me, I don't want to I don't want to give you a yeah. bad name for being a physician. So he's a doctor of psychology. He has so many credits in his curriculum vitae. I cannot describe them all, but got his doctorate in uh, 2011 from uh, California Southern University, Irvine. And he's gotten a master of arts in psychology. I mean, I can't, he's had lots of different presentations to Wash U Medical School and uh, many other groups over the years. So he knows everything that I don't know. That is why we're here. He is he's excellent and he has a health or a webcast or excuse me, a podcast called Psych with Mike and his website is Psych with Mike. So please look into that. You'll really enjoy his conversations about different psychological issues and different things that have to do with uh, your emotional life and your psychological life. So now that I've given you the intro, yes. now you have to live up to this. Um, let, let's first something really easy. Okay. Define what alcoholism is and how it differs from social drinking. So alcoholism is, would be a dependency on the drug alcohol. And just as if you had a dependency on an opiate, what that means is that your body becomes acclimated to the drug being in your system. Mm -hmm. And so when it is not there, then you have what is called withdrawal. Your body has an adverse reaction. Okay. Now, social drinking would not do that. So if you're just Correct. drinking and you don't have a craving for alcohol and you are, you are socially drinking, maybe over drinking, mm -hmm. but it isn't, hasn't become a dependency that mm -hmm. would not be call, called alcoholism. Is that correct? So if we're going to get deep into the weeds in the DSM four, mm -hmm. there was a distinction between alcohol abuse and alcohol dependence. Okay. When the DSM-5 came out, they put it on a spectrum running from mild, moderate to severe. So social drinking, if you are drinking, but you're drinking more than what would be appropriate or warranted, you would have a substance use disorder. It would be in the mild category. But as you say, you probably, you might experience cravings because you might want to drink because mm -hmm. you're drinking for situational reasons, mm -hmm. but you wouldn't have the physiological withdrawal when you didn't drink. Okay. Okay. That's very, that's very important. And it's important for people to understand that difference when they're going, oh, my Mm -hmm. 20 year old is out drinking every weekend and whether they have a problem or not, they mm -hmm. still may have a potential problem mm -hmm. because they're over drinking and they are on a spectrum that could change over time. So, but that doesn't mean if you don't drink and your child, child meaning adult child over 21 has a drink or two, they're not an alcoholic. That doesn't make them an alcoholic because you are comparing mm -hmm. yourself to them. Mm -hmm. That's, 
that's one of the things that I have I have always not understood. So mm-hmm. that's very important to me. Um, what are the so- symptoms and the signs of someone being an alcoholic? How can we how can we look at our family members or our friends and say, oh, that that may be mm, that's that we don't know if they're craving right. alcohol, we, but we see things in their lives that might indicate that they are, they are an alcoholic or becoming one. Mm-hmm. And I think that you made a really great uh, distinction there that to project onto another person what we think Mm -hmm. is not appropriate and isn't Mm -hmm. a clinical diagnosis. So a person could say, you drink, period, I don't like that, and Mm -hmm. so you have a problem. And from that person's perspective, that that might be correct and relevant, Mm -hmm. but that isn't a clinical diagnosis. So to clinically diagnose an individual with any substance use disorder, you have to have two things that are present. So you have to have tolerance which means that the individual uses more often, they seek it out, they use more than they intended to, uh, use more frequently, and you have to have withdrawal. So when the drug is not being consumed, is not present in the body, there's some physiological withdrawal syndrome that can be identified and tracked. How would someone act if they were withdrawing? And you didn't know, say you don't know what your, you know, your spouse goes out, you don't know what they're doing, they come home, what would be signs that they were withdrawing or you, you can tell when they're drinking mm-hmm. too much so because their personality and their activities are different, but mm-hmm. how would you know that they're withdrawing? So the first thing that you're going to see in anybody who is withdrawing is irritability. So the individual is going to feel badly. They're going to be short-tempered. They're going to be more critical. Mm -hmm. And that'll be the first thing that you see. If you then also see things that would be more uh, intense, like the individual might actually have, you know, withdrawal that might actually be physiologically threatening. So a person who is addicted to alcohol, when you and you know this as a physician, mm-hmm. you remove alcohol from the body, you have delirium tremors, you mm-hmm. have all kinds mm-hmm. of potential for seizure. Mm-hmm. That So that would be the most extreme. So the most mild would be irritability. The most extreme would be okay. those other physiological consequences. Now, by the time you see those really severe mm-hmm. physiological consequences, mm-hmm. it, it's going to be known. I mean, there's not going to be any way to right. hide that. Right. The individual is going to be very uh, much trying to hide that irritability. Right. So when it's mild, they're going to be in what's called denial. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. when a person confronts them, they're going to say, oh, no, this doesn't have anything to do with my alcohol mm-hmm. use. But if you watch them and you see when you see them intoxicated, mm-hmm. they're really nice. You see them not intoxicated, they're really irrita- mm-hmm. irritable, then you know that's linked to the alcohol. Okay, so that's good. That was that was my next question is why are alcoholics so so in denial? They just they don't want to be found out, they don't want to change what they're doing, is that right? Yeah, I mean they're very invested in the behavior. And mm-hmm. one of the things that I've always talked about with clients is I, I I'm wearing a blue shirt and uh I am not wearing a red shirt. I like red shirts and I think I look good in red shirts, mm-hmm. but my wife doesn't like me in red shirts. Mm-hmm. And so I don't own a red shirt. And so if your significant other were to say, hey, I don't like that color on you, you probably would be able to give that up pretty easily. Mm -hmm. If your significant other says, I don't like your drinking and you want to be invested in trying to defend that, that's denial. I see. And it's just that because it's an addiction, they want to perpetuate their activity and not let someone else change them. Partially, but also there is actually some significant success with the use of a drug. So you can use a drug like alcohol, which is a depressant. Mm -hmm. And if you're horribly depressed yourself or if you're really, really anxious and you use the drug, it's going to make you feel better. If you go to a party and you feel really, really Mm self-conscious and you have a couple of drinks, you might be much more of a social butterfly. So oftentimes in the beginning Mm -hmm. of a person's career of Mm -hmm. using, there's actually real 
definable, measurable success with the use of the drug that actually makes their life better, makes them feel better. Mm -hmm. The problem is that you say to yourself, well, if I use a little bit of this drug, that's good. Mm -hmm. So if I use more, that'll be better. And that gets you on the spiral. So I'm not an alcoholic, but when I go out to dinner and I want mm -hmm. to be coherent and not pass out, <laughs> I don't have more than two mm -hmm. regular sized drinks mm -hmm. because I know that after that point, I'm going to be exhausted, tired, stupid, right. and, and, and not be able to mentate well. Right. And so I have no tolerance, never have. So, and what I understand is, I think, and I may be wrong, that this is a genetic thing, a mm -hmm. genetic snip or a, or a genetic piece of, of your chromosomes that actually puts you at risk for this. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. you will be an alcoholic. It means that you have the potential for being an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And then other people who don't have that SNP don't understand it because they don't have that same issue. Mm -hmm. So um, family history is important. Mm -hmm. We always ask family history, and we rarely ask about whether you have alcoholism in your family unless we think maybe you've had right. a problem with alcohol. On our questionnaire, we ask, do you drink more than 12 drinks a week? Mm -hmm. So less than two drinks a day is what we consider mm -hmm. okay and not binge drinking where you drink them all in one weekend. Mm -hmm. So so we ask that question. If that is, I don't know if that's the right cutoff, mm -hmm. but um, if, if we do that, are we likely to then um, – catch people who are dependent if they're way more than 12 drinks a week? If they're being honest. If they're right. being honest. So okay. the first thing is, is that the individual has to actually give you an honest answer, okay. which the individual who is al alcoholic is probably not going to do. So you have to take that into consideration mm -hmm. that the individual may not be honest. But yes, that is kind of the rule of thumb that more than two drinks a day is problematic. Now, can you say definitively that a person who drinks more than two drinks a day is an alcoholic? No, you couldn't because technically a person could drink situationally, maybe even for a short period mm -hmm. of time, more than two drinks a day and not be alcoholic. But mm -hmm. that is a good rule of thumb. So you know what your boundaries are. You know what your tolerances mm -hmm. are. You don't want to go beyond that. An individual mm -hmm. who is potentially chemically dependent, whether that is genetically based or socialized mm -hmm. because they grew up in a family mm -hmm. where that was something that was accepted, that individual not only is not going to know where their boundaries are, okay. they're going to ignore them. Even when other people say, hey, it looks like to me that you're slurring your speech. I'm mm -hmm. not sure that you're safe to drive home. Mm -hmm. I didn't like the way that you presented yourself at that party. They're going to be in active denial about those things. Mm -hmm. No, I'm fine. Get off of my back. Is it true they don't remember how they acted? It could be. So that's called a blackout. Uh -huh. So that is actually a sign of the disease is that you actually don't remember. Uh, when I was younger and actively using, you know, when we were teenagers, we used to say the earlier you blacked out in the night, you knew that you had more fun. Right. So it was a, it was a game. Right. And now that obviously is not a good mm -hmm. way to live your life. Mm -hmm. But yes, that can oftentimes happen where a person won't remember or they will conveniently not remember because they don't want to own their behavior. I didn't do this as a physician, but as a friend, I told a, a friend of mine when, that her granddaughter was having problems. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know, if she doesn't remember something, mm -hmm. then when you know that she's drinking, and she isn't drinking right now because mm -hmm. she's been through rehab, but if you know she's drinking, take take a video of her so mm -hmm. she can see how she acts when she's drinking because mm -hmm. she doesn't remember. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that was good advice or not. I, I, I don't know if that's too confrontational or not confrontational. Or not. Right. Well, so when I was first introduced to substance abuse, as a treatment paradigm mm -hmm. was back in the 80s when I was working at a treatment center, mm -hmm. a well-known uh, treatment center in the United States. And we had football players and mm -hmm. business people and politicians mm -hmm. who came through there. And at that time, the program was squarely based on a 12-step recovery approach mm -hmm. that was highly confrontational. Mm -hmm. 
And since then, we've evolved our thinking, and there is a stage model by a couple of guys named Porsche and Decom. De Clemente, who talked about stages of change. And so now the philosophy is that you have to approach an individual from where they are. So there's pre-contemplation, contemplation, contemplation uh, preparation for change, change, and then maintenance. And mm -hmm. so if a person is in pre-contemplation, mm -hmm. so if this lady's daughter was in pre-contemplation and you confront her then that's contemplation. And so she's not going right. to be able to hear that. Right, right, right. And so interview, uh, motivational interviewing is a treatment paradigm that's exclusively based on this idea of approaching a person mm -hmm. from the stage at where uh, within which that they are mm -hmm. to try and help them to elevate them to the next stage. So in pre-contemplation, what you would do is say, hey, you know, I saw you acting oddly. Mm -hmm. That was a concern for me. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that is a fair evaluation? And they're mm -hmm. going to say no. Mm -hmm. You say, okay, so if I see it in the future, is it okay if I point it out to you? Mm -hmm. And you try and build on this, yeah, okay. the point at which the individual mm -hmm. decides, yes, that behavior mm -hmm. was inappropriate, mm -hmm. is the point at which they're going to be ready for change. Okay. That sounds, that sounds very reasonable. The confrontational 12-step program was how I was taught. Right. And it just didn't seem like that would work to me. And, and it does sometimes. Sure. And, and I mean, and the truth is that the 12 steps were derived at a point in time when the treatment for alcoholism was institutionalization mm -hmm. and the only medication was Thorazine. Right. And, oh, yeah. oh, really? Yeah. I don't even oh, remember yeah. that part. Yeah, yeah. I remember Ativan and Va Valium and things like that. No, no, no. Back in the, uh, you know, 40s, there were no okay. well, Ativan and Valium. I wasn't around then, so. No, no, no. But, yeah. but that's how, that's when these programs mm -hmm. developed. Okay. And so that was better mm -hmm. than what was happening at the time. Mm -hmm. But to say that that's the only thing that we should use for all of it time mm -hmm. is inappropriate. Right. If we evolve our understanding of the disease, mm -hmm. then our the way that we treat that should evolve with it. And so the stages of change model has really helped us evolve our understanding of the disease and hopefully our understanding of the treatment. But does that mean that confrontation can't work? No, but it is less likely to be effective than the stages, stages of change approach. That's very interesting and very informative for me because when I see things that don't work, I wonder mm -hmm. why. <laughs> and and but I don't really know since I haven't been in medical school or residency. Of course, in residency in OBGYN, they talk nothing about this. Mm -hmm. Even though many of our patients came in, our clinic patients came in drunk mm -hmm. and they were pregnant and ready to deliver, and then we would have to deal with the dependence of the baby, mm -hmm. which was huge. So uh, that's the only place we talked about it. We didn't talk about it in terms of family practice or general practice and what we could do to help our patients. Mm -hmm. I, my, I, I need a piece of advice on this. Okay. When patients come in, I had a couple come in a, long, a while ago, and both of the people were drunk, mm -hmm. both of them. And they're both asking me to fix them physiologically and and metabolically mm -hmm. and they have a lot of abnormalities in their blood work mm -hmm. but they I don't know what to say to them is that I can smell them both mm -hmm. from across the desk mm -hmm. and they don't know they don't think I can tell mm -hmm. and Especially when I first meet somebody, I don't want to have them like explode and leave or, or become combatant. Mm -hmm. One of the members was um, sexually assertive to me, mm -hmm. and his wife was like, "eh," because mm -hmm. she's all she's kind of spaced out. So I don't have I don't have a good answer for that kind of interaction, mm -hmm. especially with someone who is not in their right mind, which is what I would call it. Mm -hmm. So I ignored it, mm -hmm. and I shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. But what would you suggest that a good way of dealing with something like that? Because I know family members deal with that too. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they know their spouse is drunk, but they can smell it. They mm -hmm. can see it. The activity is their their um, 
uh, reticent to change or reticent to do anything productive in there, and they just know that that's what's affecting them. But confronting them is a scary process. Mm-hmm. So I need your advice. So I always try and encourage people to be aware of what they have control over. So if you're a spouse, you have control over the amount of investment that you have in the relationship or Mm -hmm. if you're even going to be in the relationship. Mm -hmm. But that's really it. So you can't control how much the other person drinks. You can say, if you continue to drink this way, number one, I'm not going to ride in a car with you. You can say, if you continue to drink this way, I'm not going to allow our children to ride in a car with you. You can say, if you continue to drink this way, I'm not going to be in this relationship with you. But those are the only things that you can do. Because you can't change somebody else. Right. And yet you should never say any of those things unless you can actually carry through. So as a parent, you should never threaten a child unless you're actually going to do it. Mm -hmm. As a spouse, you should never say, I'm going to do this if you don't stop unless you can do it. Mm -hmm. As a physician, I would say you have control over whether or not you treat that individual. It is, I was going to say infuriating, it's not infuriating, it's concerning to me. Um, Obviously, I work in the field of psychology. I've seen psychiatrists who are treating individuals with psychotropic medications, medications that cross the blood-brain barrier Mm -hmm. and actually have a profound impact on Mm -hmm. the human brain, Mm -hmm. and they're doing this while they know that this individual is abusing Mm -hmm. substances. I don't believe that that's appropriate. I don't think any psychotropic medications should be utilized if a person also is abusing these other substances. And we know that hormones are, they're not neurotransmitters, they're neuromodulators, but Mm -hmm. we don't have to talk about what the difference Mm -hmm. in that is. But, But we know that those things have an impact on the brain. And so I would say I am concerned about treating you with these medications if I think that you might be abusing alcohol. Mm -hmm. And so I need you to be very honest with me about what your usage is. But I think that's really hard to do. It is. It is because even though they both said we have a problem with alcohol, but they said, oh, but we're not dependent. Oh, this is fine. We're just, I'm thinking if you're not dependent, then why are you drinking before you come to see? Mm -hmm. I mean, (laughs) that should be pretty obvious. Exactly. Why would you go to something as important as an interview with a physician who is going to treat you medically drunk. Right. I mean, it, it made no sense. And they wouldn't remember what I said anyway. Mm-hmm. That's the other thing is that oftentimes my patients who have abused alcohol don't remember the conversation at all. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't, you never said that to me. Mm-hmm. I didn't hear that. Mm-hmm. So then I have to be very careful about everything that I write down and I write things down that I mm-hmm. want them to do, like, supplements and exercise and i'm trying to get them healthier so that they can then say no decide Mm -hmm. to be um without alcohol or go through a program what i do tell them is never go cold turkey from alcohol alone right if you go into rehab under a doctor or a nurse practitioner's uh, care Care. Mm -hmm. you need to have the facilities IVs, you need drugs, Mm -hmm. you need medication. If you go cold turkey without it, many times you Mm -hmm. can die. You'll Mm -hmm. seize and die. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I don't want... They get the wrong message. They they get the message that I'm saying, Mm -hmm. don't stop drinking. I'm saying, don't do it by yourself. And you need to go into rehab and then get the proper treatment. And medically assisted treatment, which is what that's called, MAT, Uh, mm -hmm. um, medically assisted treatment, is the best practice now in our understanding of of the disease. Yeah, Uh, because exactly for that reason that you could seize and die. Mm -hmm. And so the old kind of confrontational approach, just stop drinking cold turkey, is not what we encourage people to do today. Isn't almost every other drug okay to just stop i mean not all Mm -hmm. in fact lots of of thing lots of drugs that affect your neurotransmitters like psychotropic drugs and antidepressants you shouldn't just stop Mm -hmm. but other drugs that are uh, addictive often can be stopped without killing 
Sure. Oh, yeah. But not this drug. Yeah. Uh, and, and and opioids, while that's going to be really, really uncomfortable, mm -hmm. the withdrawal from that is going to mm -hmm. be really uncomfortable, it won't kill you. Mm -hmm. Alcohol is really exclusively the drug that we know of that if you stop doing it, you are potentially at risk for some real severe physiological consequences. You know, it's, it's interesting. Alcohol, just like other drugs, can be used for, for beneficial things. I remember, it's, this is how old I am. When I first did OB, we mm -hmm. didn't have terbutaline. Mm -hmm. Now we use terbutaline off label to stop labor. We used to hang a bag of alcohol, mm -hmm. and we would give IV alcohol to women who were in preterm labor to stop mm -hmm. their labor, and it worked. Mm -hmm. It stopped the smooth muscle contractions. Mm -hmm. And I used to think how crazy that is, but used in that way, mm -hmm. it's not going to hopefully make that person dependent because it's a short-term thing. Oh, absolutely, right. And One so exposure is not going to, right. It's not a an excuse to use mm -hmm. alcohol, but it is the other flip side of it, mm -hmm. that it could and used to be used, I mean, in the old days, here, bite on this stick and take a drink of whiskey, right, right. and then we'll take your appendix out. I mean, right. that was what people did. Mm -hmm. So those were those were kind of some of the things I remember back in the old days that we used to do with um, at with alcohol as a drug. Mm -hmm. But now we have better drugs. Mm -hmm. We don't need that. Right. So um, I th next the next time we talk mm -hmm. will be next week. And I'm. I would like to know what happens in rehab exactly. And so we're going to talk about that okay. because I don't have a clue. Mm -hmm. In the old days, I knew that was thirty years ago. Mm -hmm. I have no clue. And when you talk to people, they go, "I don't know. I just uh, I went to meetings, and you know." But you know what happens. Mm -hmm. So please join us next week, and we will have more of Psych with Mike on our <laughs> on our Healthcast. <laughs> Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth.